everyone. So the processor space is really exciting at the moment for PC users and constructors. So for years we had dual core and quad core Intel CPUs dominating the market. I mean, literally eight years on from the release of the Core i7-920 until Intel eventually moved on to the six core i7-8700K. Eight years of mostly iterative upgrades before a genuine leap. And now, possibly thanks to competitive pressure from AMD, another leap is heading our way with Intel matching the 8-core Ryzen 7 spec with, yes, 8 physical cores and 16 threads via 9th Gen Core i7 and i9 products. Okay, so we can pretty much take it as read that octo-core chips are happening, even though there hasn't been an official announcement. I mean, board manufacturer ASRock has rather handily confirmed it by attaching these stickers to their entry-level boards, and that in itself is valuable info. It means that you won't need to upgrade your Coffee Lake motherboard to get access to the new top-end chips, and yeah, an entry-level board should be able to power them as well. From there, we move into leaked spec territory with this breakdown of the new unlocked K chips. So yeah, there it is, the Core i9-9900K. Pretty phenomenal specs there, 5 gigahertz single core turbo, dropping only 300 megahertz to 4.7 gigahertz when all cores are active simultaneously. So compared to the 8700K then, two extra cores, four extra threads, plus a 400 megahertz increase to that crucial all core turbo power. Kind of sounds too good to be true, more on that in a sec. But conversely, the new i7, well, according to the leak, the 9700K still has eight cores, but no hyper-threading, which is interesting. Finally, there's the new i5K chip, the 9600K. Six cores, six threads, eminently believable spec all round. It's an evolution of the 8600K, effectively. I guess the question is, are those octo-core specs believable? Not only are we getting more Intel cores than we've ever had in the mainstream space, we're also getting higher clocks. Well, German website golem.de has a potential answer here, saying that the heat spreader on the eight core chips will actually be soldered to the processor die, not using thermal compound as has been the case on Intel mainstream chips since the third gen era. Better heat transfer coupled with a decent cooler should make those high clocks possible. Golem also says that six cores and under retains the thermal paste, meaning that clocks are lower there. Now let's talk about the lack of hyper-threading on the i7. Okay, so somehow the concept of an i7 without hyper-threading doesn't seem right. There should still be a performance boost over the 8700K. I mean, if we flash back to the i5 8600K against the i7 7700K, there was an uptick in performance. Not a massive one, but there it is. Combined with the clock's advantage, I reckon the new i7 should be pretty decent, actually, while the i9 has serious potential. But I guess the question is, will moving to eight cores offer up any real advantages for gaming? Okay, so there's been a myth for years that I've really tried to dispel that the old quad-core i5 was just as good as the i7 for gaming because few titles used more than four threads. But since the arrival of current-gen consoles, that really hasn't been the case, especially on console ports. I mean, CPUs on the likes of PS4 and Xbox One are weak enough that going wide and using all of those available cores is kind of a must. It's not just ashes of the singularity either. I mean, Crisis 3 is a 2013 game actually tied to last gen console development, and there's still great scaling there. So will another two cores make a genuine difference to gaming? Now, I can't wait to find out, but I'd say that based on the data available, we stand a pretty good chance. I mean, Intel has been making many core chips for years now in its enthusiast line. The latest, Skylake X had some real issues with gaming, but returning to Crisis 3 again. Yes, there is still a bump moving from quad to hexacore to octacore and even up to 10 cores with 20 threads with the Core i9 7900X. Similar situation with The Witcher 3 here. I mean, in these titles, there are obviously diminishing returns with the extra cores, but they are being utilized. 
And of course, the fact is that the design of Intel's enthusiast chips, like Ryzen, favours productivity over gaming. The surrounding fabric around the cores is better for gaming on the mainstream processors. But the core itself though, yeah, it's much the same. So yeah, I am expecting better scalability and more overhead. And overhead is obviously a good thing on a processor. It means it will last for longer. But bearing in mind how insanely powerful the 8700K is in the here and now, to what extent is even more processing power actually meaningful? Yeah, I've got two responses to this. So first of all, here's the thing. Next gen consoles are gonna set a new baseline for hardware requirements on PC ports. The CPU is easily the most next gen thing Xbox 2 or PS5 are gonna have about them. In terms of bang for the buck in terms of silicon area, one Ryzen CCX is going to deliver a lot of performance, but two of them, this is still a relatively small amount of silicon and it would really future-proof hardware that's got to persist for another six or seven years. So yeah, a generational leap in console CPU power, something we didn't really get with PS4 and Xbox One. Yeah, that's going to require a big step up on the PC side to keep pace. And that's why I'm all for this increasing core count from both Intel and AMD processors. If you don't see the boost in the short term, I'm pretty sure you'll see it in the longer term. Okay, and secondly, even in the here and now, the trend for refresh rates on monitors is rising. 60 Hertz still accounts for a good majority of screens sold, I warrant, but the fact is that 75, 90, for VR of course, 120, 144, 165, even 240 Hertz, it's all happening in the monitor space. All of these screens are appearing because there's demand, because they sell. Intel's processors are the fastest for gaming, and while moving from six to eight cores won't give you a fully equivalent 33% increase in performance, it will definitely be significant on fully threaded engines. And another thing, I've got to say that I think that the way we review CPUs doesn't really help to illustrate how important they are. So yeah, I'm fully aware that I owe all of you a Ryzen 2000 review, but what's been bugging me still after all of these years is the extent to which reviews actually measure CPU gaming workloads. In fact, there are also questions as to how useful in-game benchmarks generally are for gaming. Now, I worked with Alex who did a great video on this and I've put a link to that in the description below and I highly recommend checking it out. But here's a snippet. Rise of the Tomb Raider's geothermal valley as represented in the benchmark and in game. Big difference, right? Well, I just don't think the CPU is really being put through its paces in proper in-game conditions on the benchmark there, effectively making it a GPU test. And that's fine, but not when it comes to measuring CPU performance. And I want to explain how difficult this is. A classic example here using legacy data. The Division, even using a Titan X Pascal overclocked at 1080p resolution to do our best to remove the GPU limit, it's actually difficult to show much in the way of difference between any given processor. There are games, many games, where you simply won't be CPU bound. And in these scenarios, benchmarking is effectively a measurement of the GPU. Then there are games like Far Cry 5 here. This isn't legacy data, by the way. It's brand new with all Meltdown and Spectre Windows patches and BIOS updates enabled. Pretty big difference here between 8700K and Ryzen 7 2700X here with the Titan X at 1080p, but it also includes data at 1440p. The gap closes up as GPU has more of an influence on the result. In effect, the 8700K is 20% ahead at 1080p, but that drops to 10% at 1440p. And that tells us that what result you're gonna get is very much dependent on the GPU that you're testing with. So, is this a GPU test or a CPU test? It's a difficult one. So, with benchmarks of varying usefulness then, I've been looking for even stronger CPU concentrated workouts. I've got a PUBG replay here which throws up some interesting results. The beginning of the game crams all of the players into the same space and with the parachute descent right up until landing we are very much CPU bound. You can see that here as the 1080p and 1440p results pretty much the same but once we land and terrain rendering takes more of a focus the 1440p results drop. Still the frame rates overall 
are impressive, very impressive. But yeah, you can still see that the GPU can have an impact. You've got to pick and choose your tests very carefully. So, do you reckon an i7-8700K can run anything above 60 frames per second? Alex and I worked on this crisis stress test showing that even today the latest Verizons and i7s can choke in some scenarios. But that's a game heavily reliant on single thread performance in a many core era. What about something more modern? Well, Kingdom Come Deliverance on Ultra High in this town run through really puts any CPU, no matter how powerful, through its paces. And yeah, those big RTS games can also cause issues. The Total War Thrones of Britannia benchmark here stays above 60 frames per second on the i7, but the Ryzen processor drops beneath. Now, Total War's engine is pretty old, and it's fairly easy to see that while it's multi-core aware, it's not utilizing all those threads, which leads us on to a game that does. Ashes of the Singularity with its CPU benchmark. I spoke to Oxide Games about this one. It's a simulation of four AIs battling it out in a big world with a lot of units. And yeah, the stress test here is phenomenal. But Oxide tells me that real life gaming scenarios can actually move beyond this. So yeah, this is an interesting example of a benchmark that is truly CPU bound and uses as many cores and threads that's thrown at it and it's still highly demanding. And yeah, we could use more benchmarks like this. Benchmarks that actually ensure that the CPU is getting the work out and that the GPU isn't getting a look in. Okay, so let's wrap this one up. More powerful CPUs are coming along and I say, bring them on. The faster your CPU, the more the most taxing CPU bound scenarios are mitigated, raising performance. Higher clocks on the new wave of CPUs are great, but more cores will make a difference too. Modern engines do scale, and it's a trend that's only going to continue once next-gen Ryzen-equipped consoles arrive, when there's a strong chance that the baseline CPU requirements for AAA titles could rise significantly. And in the here and now, more power simply means more overhead, more future-proofing for your system, not to mention faster productivity outside of gaming. Of course, there's a strong argument for best price versus performance. There always is, but equally, there's just as much of an argument for really pushing on the amount of CPU power we have available. As things stand, the Core i7-8700K is pretty much the fastest gaming CPU ever made, and with faster clocks and two more cores, the 9900K should be a monster, and I look forward to reviewing it. But that's all for me for now. You know the score? Like, subscribe, and ring the bell if you're already subbed for instant notifications. And yeah, if you'd like to support Digital Foundry more directly, please consider our Patreon, where you can grab pristine quality video downloads. But that's all for me for now. Thanks for watching.